Hello! Steven Mating here, also known as Dunbaratu on GitHub, from the KOS project, and I'm going to be demonstrating to you a, a little teaser of the new user functions feature coming up in 0.17 of KOS. This is the thing I've been primarily working on. Um, it's not the only thing in 0.17, but it's the thing I've been spending most of my time on, so it's the thing I'm going to showcase in the video. Okay, so first off, I want to show the thing in use. What I have done is I have made a couple of user functions to handle an automatic generic uh, PID controller. And using those functions that I made using the user land functions, these are the same thing that anything else that anyone else can use now. You don't have to be a developer of the project to use this. Um, I used them to make a very simple hover script that is operating entirely based on the PID control functions that I created. If you don't know what the word PID control means, um, just look up PID space control on Google and you'll find lots of stuff on what that means. It's a very specific thing about trying to robotically control items. Okay, so here I have my little craft. I call him Hover Bob. I put little face on him only because I need to be able to see which way is front to pilot the thing. The goal of my script is to simply hover my bot at a certain altitude and keep him there. I control the steering, I can, you know, move him around, but the the script will just hold him in steady. And then I'll, after I show off that, I'll go and show you the script. Okay. So, switch to zero. Test lib pid. Okay, there we go. It's thrusting up and seeking an altitude. And if you look here, oops, let me, uh, Turn on SAS, I forgot to do that. There we go. Um, if you look here, it's seeking an alt radar of 15 meters. So it's trying to stay only 15 meters up off the whatever the ground it senses under it is. And it's doing that very steadily. If I tilt it back forward again here, fly back over the pad, you'll see it automatically pop itself up a bit when it gets over the pad. and automatically fall down when it gets to the other side. It is attempting to maintain height above ground, not height altitude in general. Okay, so it also will automatically compensate for any deflection angle. So as I manually pilot it off to the side like this, it is changing the amount of throttle that it knows it needs to match that. So this is your, this is your standard PID control technique to make a hovercraft. Um, the, the hovercraft isn't the point of this demonstration. The point is going to be to show you how functions were used to make this. But I also wanted to show this off for a little bit because I kind of like it. And it's, it's really steady too. You can see in here how it's doing a pretty good job of trying really hard to seek the steady level. is flying it around the base here a little bit. And all I'm doing is leaving the SAS on and tilting it to move it. I am not touching the throttle. It's handling that for me. Hey, maybe I'll try and fly it under that building through that little hole. That would be a thing I would never attempt to do by hand. Now, it looks as if I'm too high. So uh, the script is set up so I press the 1 or the 2 key to change the seek altitude. So let me... Uh, lower the seek altitude by a meter at a time. There we go. That looks low enough. I will now tilt it forward and zoom through the tunnel. Camera gets a little screwed up here. So anyway, um, that shows the simple hover script. Let's up the seek altitude a little bit here, and then end the script by turning the gear on. And I have it set so when I end the script, it doesn't kill the throttle. It just leaves it where it was. Oops, yeah, oh well. Didn't land it very well when we went to manual control. But anyway, now let's show the actual script in action and show how it used functions to do that.
Okay, first off, when I ran the main script, I set a variable seek alt to 15, that's the default seeking altitude of the hover script. Done to false, standard stuff. When I hit action group 9, set done to true. Actually, I do that a different way now. This can be removed from the script. This is actually not necessary. But here's the important bit. Up near the top, I run libphysics and libpid, which are nothing more than the name of two other script files that I created up here. And these two script files, I'll start with libphysics, uh, don't do anything other than just create functions and quit. So I run them from the program that wants to use the functions, and they will build them into memory and then do nothing else. This is the way the function syntax looks. We reused the declare command to be used for functions as well now. So it's declare, function, name of function, open a brace, put some code in, end a brace. And you can put a return in there if you want your function to return a value. So in this example, I'm making a function called g here, which will return the gravity acceleration at the ship's current location using the absolute bog standard Newton gravity formula. Mass of the planet times the radius I am from the planet center, or divided by the radius I am from the planet center squared times the gravitational constant. That's the acceleration of gravity here. And then I have another function fg here, which is the force due to gravity here, which of course is you take the g here and multiply it by the ship mass to get the force g here. The reason I call this lib physics is I do intend to go through, for the rest of the scripts I'm going to write in my future personal use, I'm going to make a lot more of this kind of little utility function and put it in here. Uh, this thing called lazy global off, I won't cover what that means now, I'll cover what that means in this next script. The next thing I run is called libpid, right here. And libpid creates two functions called pid init and pid seek, which are used to do the proportional integral derivative controller. And here I will show what lazy global, lazy global off does. We've added a new kind of syntax called a compiler directive that works by putting an, amp, an at sign at the beginning, stating a thing, and then giving it a value. Right now, the only kind of compiler directive that exists is the word lazy global, um, and you can set it on or off. On, by the way, is the default. It's the same thing as not even mentioning it. Now, what lazy global means is this. You know how in the past, by default, if you simply say set x to 1, x did not have to be a variable before that. The system will automatically create an x for you if one doesn't already exist. That behavior is what I'm referring to as lazy global. It means you don't have to declare x. The first time you try to set something into it, it will automatically cause it to come into existence. There are very good reasons why, if you're writing a library of routines, you really want to try to avoid that if you can, and you, and you really don't want the compiler to do that for you. So lazy global off tells the compiler to stop allowing you to make lazy globals. You will, if you turn lazy global off, then for the duration of that code, you are required to declare every variable explicitly. And that's, that's actually a good idea to do if you're going to try and catch yourself and make sure you don't make any typos or anything. Uh, this is a fairly common technique used when you have a scripting language that previously was sloppy and allowed people to do things without declaring them, and then starts adding in concepts like local variables after that. Uh, if you're ever familiar with the language Perl, it came across the same problem, and they created a directive called use strict that says, please disable the default global making behavior and instead throw an error if I try to use a variable I never defined. That's, this is me following that same paradigm here, this lazy global off. I recommend that you use that in all of your library making scripts, but then don't use it in your library using scripts. That's, that's my recommendation. Okay, so what do I mean by making local variables? Well, here I am declaring a function called pid in it. I declare the parameters up front. This is very, very similar to declaring parameters for an entire file that you run, only in this case they're the parameters to the function. So it's context sensitive now. If you say declare a parameter inside a declare function, it knows that you mean parameters to the function as opposed to parameters to the whole file. You can still make parameters to an entire file by putting the declare parameter section up at the top and it'll behave like you're used to. KP, KI, and KD are the uh, tuning parameters for the PID controller. If you know what a PID controller is, those terms will look familiar to you. So what I do is I call PID init, and I give it the tuning parameters I would like, and it will create a PID controller for me. 
declare variable name to value is how you make a local variable now. So these are making a bunch of local variables that will stop existing when the function finishes. We have, we have instituted local scope with this. Um, the declare statement makes a local value, value that will go away whenever it hits the end of the brace section that it was created in. You can create variables that are local to any brace scope. So you could make variables that are local to a loop or local to an if condition and so on. So I make a bunch of these. I create a pid array and I populate it with these default values that I made and I will return that back to the caller. So when you call this, it creates this little list of things and gives it back to you, which are just default values other than the three tuning parameters you gave it. Okay. And then PID seek is what you call each and every time you do a loop iteration when you want to use your PID controller. You pass in the PID array that you made with an earlier PID in it, which it will use to track the previous values for the position and so on that the PID controller needs to know. So you pass that in, and then you pass it in a, a number for the value that your PID controller is trying to seek, and then pass in a number for what that value currently looks like. Um, and based upon that alone, it will spit out a return value down here, a return value of what the whatever the input should now be uh, for the next iteration. And it does this without having any knowledge of what any of this stuff means, because a proper PID controller doesn't care about the actual mathematical uh, function that the, that the property be, uh, follows. It's going to just iteratively, on the fly, numerically approximate the derivative and the integral to work it out. So it takes it makes a bunch of local variables out of that array and uh, does some checks to make sure that it doesn't do anything on the very first pass where it doesn't have a previous value to work with. And then this down here is just your standard, whoopsie, didn't mean to do that. This down here is just your standard PID controller type of thing, which this is a thing you should be all familiar with if you've done PID controllers before. And if you haven't, the purpose of this video is not to teach how a PID controller works. You can, you can look that up elsewhere. And then it remembers the, the new value it gave, puts these results into the array so it'll be able to pick them up next time, and returns back to you what you should do with your new controller. And as long as the control that you want it to fiddle with happens to be a control that is either directly or indirectly connected to whatever these values are that you're handing in, everything should work automatically. In, in principle. So this is a very low-level PID controller that has no knowledge what it's being used for, and I intend to use this as a low-level function in a lot of my future scripts. So I, I run libphysics, I run libpid after I print out a bunch of stuff. I set up some triggers. Action group 1 and 2 are what changes the altitude. Uh, turn off the throttle. Stage until I've got some working engine going. I make a function here as well for myself to call, which does nothing more than just print out all the display values up into here at a coordinates I tell it to as parameters. So there's another example of using a function. And the actual content of the hover script that you just watched is just this, this bit alone. It's very simple. I calculate the middle throttle point, which is the throttle point that hovers me exactly against gravity in principle, by calling fg here, which you remember is a function I made up here. So I call my own function fg here, divided by how much total available thrust the ship could do if I was at 100% throttle, to get the fractional throttle that would be roughly a hover. It doesn't have to be exact, by the way. This just helps the PID controller be a little bit quicker by starting it off with a middle value that's, you know, normal. Uh, TH offset is how much to add or subtract from the mid throttle to get the actual throttle we're going to use. We're going to lock the throttle to that mid throttle plus the throttle plus the throttle offset. Throttle offset, by the way, is the value that I'm going to hand to the PID controller and let it control. So, I set hover PID to calling PID init, which you remember was the function that I started up here. I call PID init. It returns back a list of some interesting stuff. These are the values I chose for my for my tuning parameters turn the gear off. The only reason I turn it on first and then off is because there's a weird effect in Kerbal Space Program where gear doesn't work the very first time you hit it. So to get around that, I just turn it on and then off rather than just turning it off. Until I turn the gear back on again, just keep looping. 
Um, and all I do when I keep looping is take that throttle offset and set it to the new value the PID controller tells me to set it to when I give it the tracking array it was using, the altitude I would like to seek, and what the altitude currently is. Just do that in a loop over and over again, and that is all I do. And of course I print out the display as I do it. That's it. All this little code is now very small and easy to read because of the fact that I made this function for myself to use. So that's how the new feature is going to work in a nutshell. Um, it is my hope, I know that I've heard a lot of people state that, that what they would like to do is as a user community using KOS, they would like to create their own a library of routines that they can share back and forth between each other for doing generic small tasks and build up their own user level library of things. There's been, a, there's been some sort of abortive attempts to try that, but I think that's been hindered by the inability to do proper functions. I am hoping that now that this feature is going to exist, that uh, the attempts of the user community to build their own pile of files and call it a library for themselves is going to happen. I hope you all get to use this. I'm, I'm pretty psyched about it. It doesn't quite do classes yet, you don't have structures, but that's going to come later. I, 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 we're, we've been talking about it, we're probably going to do it at some point, but first we really had to revamp everything about the main engine. There's a lot of people who think that it's a poor idea for us to be using our own homebrewed language, that we should, we should have made everything using a, an existing language. But the problem is, the language isn't really the difficulty. All this is is running a standard parser configurator and a standard compiler that reads it and spits things out. That part's not hard if, you, if you've done it a lot in computer science before. It's a very standard problem. The part where all the work comes in is that the opcodes it creates has to run in a virtual fake computer. And it's the creation of the capabilities in the virtual fake computer that's actually where all the time is spent. The virtual fake computer had no concept of stacked variables and therefore couldn't do local scoping. And if you can't do local scoping, you can't really properly do functions. So that was the major overhaul we had to do, was getting the local scoping to work correctly. Anyway, um, I hope this, uh, hope this is useful. I hope it, people uh, enjoy using it, and uh, good luck with it. This should be coming out fairly soon now. We have, uh, we're on the final stretches of it. Um, we're basically just doing QA and documentation fixing, so it shouldn't be long now. We're, our goal is to get this out, you know, before uh, Kerbal Space Program 1.0 drops, because once that drops, we're going to be pretty busy making that work. So, uh, good luck, everyone.